and and then we'll ask God's blessing on what we're doing today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you. We give you all the praise and glory. We thank you, Lord, for another beautiful day. Lord, we pray for all those on our prayer list. Uh, we got a good, a pretty good sized prayer list. But Lord, you you are the great physician. You can handle any of these situations, whether they're medical, you know, Lord, salvation, all of those things, Lord. We just ask that you would allow the Holy Spirit to work in the lives of all the people that are we've talked about. Uh, put your healing grace on them. And so, Lord, I pray for our class. I pray for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we, we've been going through the whole book of Esther in terms of studies we've we've had basically this is our eighth lesson and this one is called deciding to remember deciding to remember and so we want to close out the series today on this so what I want to do is get you involved in this so instead of me doing a lot of talking up here I want to I want to hear from you so um this whole book of Esther is, a, is an awesome demonstration of how God works in the lives of people and how he's had his hand in their life and the affairs of, of the men and women and how God delivers and how we are to remember. So if you remember, uh, Brian had a, on the chart, there was a chart of the Jewish calendar. And so one of the celebrations is Purim. So we're going to talk about Purim today also. So on your handout, if it's, uh, it should be listed there, Esther chapter 9, verses 27 through chapter 10, verse 3. I'm going to read that. The Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves unto them, so as it should not fail that they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time every year, and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, in every city, and that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews. So that's what that proclamation he's saying, Purim needs to be celebrated from now on. Nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. Then Esther the queen, the daughter of Ab Abihel, and Mordecai the Jew, wrote with all authority to confirm this second letter of Purim. And he sent the letters unto all the Jews to the 120 and seven provinces, of the kingdom of Ahasuerus with words of peace and truth. That's the king. To confirm these days of Purim in those times appointed, according to Mordecai the Jew and Esther the queen, had enjoined them. And as they had decreed for themselves and for their seed the matters of the fasting and their cry. And the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. And in chapter 10, verse 1, And the king of Ahasuerus laid a tribute upon the land and upon the isles of the sea, and all the acts of his power and of his might, and the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai, whereunto the king advanced him, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was next unto king Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews, and accepted the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people, and speaking peace to all his seed. So, so the king not only, they wrote it, but the king backed it up with his own hand on it saying this is something that has to be done so every generation we should know that needs to be taught God's plan of redemption that can happen through traditions I'm not talking about rituals I'm talking about traditions uh, traditions that preserve biblical heritage and understanding for others so so I want to give you the fill-ins because I today I would like your input so the first one is ordained decision. Yeah, Charlie, you can fast forward through that as I, as I throw it out there. Ordained decision. Letter A, comprehensive. There it is on the screen in case you're looking. Letter B is written. Letter C is memorialize. Number two is rehearse decision. Rehearse decision. Letter three 
Letter A is perpetual. Letter B is particular. Letter C, official. Number three is sustained decision. Sustained decision. And then under that, letter A is leadership is established. And letter B, leadership is effective. Anybody miss one? Got them all. Okay. Great. So, so when Brian spoke the last time, we saw that the Jews established the Feast of Purim so that they would not forget God's deliverance of them. So like I said, for this final session, I want to focus on understanding the importance of keeping biblical traditions. So it was Esther's uncle, Mordecai, who was instrumental in preserving and writing the biblical tradition. So from the time we started this series, we have followed the story of Esther and we've seen God's sovereign hand at work in and through Esther's life. We saw her awesome courage and what she went through because she risked her life. Because if you know something about traditional history back in the day, you could not go into the king's presence unless you were asked to. And if you walked in there, that was sudden death. Even a relative or a wife or whoever, you couldn't do that. So it's important that we teach our children, our grandchildren, and great-grandchildren in, in some cases. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have grandchildren? Keep your hands up. How many of you have great-grandchildren? How many of you have great-great-grandchildren? OK. Yeah, that's good. That, so grandchildren, great-grandchildren, that's good. Not great-great. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's important that, you know, that we teach them biblical traditions. And uh, which doesn't mean, mean receiving a gift. You know, most kids, uh, they're looking for a present. If you, if they, traditionally this Christmas, they're going to get a gift at Christmas. They're going to get a gift at their birthday. Those are, that's when you give them gifts. And I've seen where some people gave gifts out at Thanksgiving, you know, and it happens, I guess. But, uh, but all celebrations and traditions do not mean people receiving a gift. So naturally we can forget about things, but we should try our best to remember those life-changing moments that God placed in our life. Life-changing moments. We may need to write them down, okay? Uh, but your love for God should prompt you not to forget these life-changing moments that God delivered you. So here's my first challenge to you. So I want to encourage you to share your faith and testimonies with us today and share them with your future generations, in other words, your family. So in giving your testimonies, tell us why you remember the day of your salvation. What was it like? I want, I'm asking that. Maybe you don't know the date, because I don't. I don't know the date. I remember pretty close to when it happened. I think I was around seven years old, somewhere around there, but I don't remember the date. There are some people who have that date written in their Bible, you know, because it happened later on in their life, or mom wrote it in, the, in her Bible when you got saved. But that's the most important part is you know you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know that. And so, and how did you feel when, uh, when God delivered you just like he delivered the Jews, you know, from Haman? So, so let me ask you a question. Does anyone want to share your salvation moment? Your salvation moment, the, the day you got saved, and how did you feel about that? Anybody? Nobody? Oh, is that a hand? Okay, thank, thank you. 
Uh, we were, we were, I would say, harassed to go to church. <laughs> we were begged by Terry Joe to go to church, and over and over and over. So finally, we decided we'd go to church. And they had a revival guy there, and he was teaching. And the end of the service, the guy said, "Would anyone like to come forward?" He goes forward. I'm scared to death. <laughs> I am petrified. Why is he going forward? What's, what's the deal? I was petrified. And so later we went to Terry and Candy Joe's house, and Terry explained it to me, and I got saved. We both did. But the moment was shocking, scary, because he was in tears. And I couldn't figure out why he was in tears. So it was kind of an exciting, scary, exciting day when Terry and Candy loved me for the Lord. So where was that at? We were, we were at Candy and Terry's house when I finally got saved. But the, he, so got, least, he went to the church. We were at Lee Summit Bible, Bible Church. church. Lee Summit, okay. Was that Fred Allen's church? No. No, Lee Summit well, Bible. That was Pickard. Roger Pickard. Oh, okay. All right. So you were in tears, mm -hmm. and she was trying to figure out why you were crying. <laughs> and then you found out when you had your moment. When we went to their house and Terry explained Terry everything explained to me. Everything. Yeah. Everything to me and what happened and Candy did too. And I accepted Christ. Yeah, Same awesome. Day. Awesome. Anybody else? Carl. Uh, when we joined KCBT in 67, Glade DeVore got me driving bus for vacation Bible school. And I drove bus for many years. And in 1973, at KCBT, they had a movie night, Pilgrim's Progress. And at the end of the movie, Roscoe Brewer offered an invitation. And he said, anybody that needs Christ, raise your hand. And I raised my hand, and Roscoe Brewer said he almost fell off the platform. <laughs> and uh, I, can't I can't remember who it was that led me to Christ. Wow. Were you a rascal? Is that the reason why he almost fell off the... <laughs> well, just the fact that I'd driven a church bus for probably five years. Oh, okay. Well, it was more than that because we started, I started in 67 when uh, Harold Massey and Galata DeVore came to the front door and invited us to church and finally Linda and our son, I was working nights and uh, Linda got up and got our son ready and she woke me up and said we're Stephen and I are going to church if you want to go fine if you don't go back to sleep <laughs> so I got up and went to church and uh, that's when it was the start of vacation Bible school and Galata asked me to drive a bus and uh so from 67 to 73, that's about six years. Wow. Uh, and then I realized I wasn't saved. I was playing church. So you were going to church. Yeah. And you didn't really have that personal relationship with Christ because it was more about just going. I was there. And you were there, and you were doing things. Yeah. So, anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It might take a little while, but I'll try to get into it. In 1980, 1982, I got involved in a train accident. I was 29 days unconscious, and couple people, well, three people, Farrell Hunt, which goes to church here, Dave Warren and Alice Warren, his daughter, came to visit me at 
Canada, the red been sitting down 32nd Main. I didn't want to have nothing to do with church people. That's a bunch of wimps, you know. <laughs> I, I, I was having my decent dude because I accepted their invitation to go to church. I figured, man, they don't even know me, but they came to visit me. And, well, I didn't have a very hard time, you know. So I agreed to go to church. Go to a bar buffet with them on Monday night. And I had the bar buffet at the end of the Bible study. The pastor, he got and said, If any of you want to know for sure you're going to heaven, raise your hand. I'll have a gentleman, if you're a man or a lady, if you're a woman, and will you have a heart and show you from the Bible. What God had to say about eternal life. I Man, I said, all right, you know, I was in a wheelchair then, had a patch on my eye, I looked like a pirate. And, you know, and then he goes, well, now I want you guys, whoever rose your hand, I want you to think about this. If you were really serious and wanted to know for sure, well, just stand up where you at. I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't stand up. Man, that bummed me out big time. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't receive Christ Jesus that night, but I was compelled to go back the following Monday night. I went back and said more day. He said, if any of you want to know Jesus Christ is your Savior, want to know for sure, if you're going to have him, raise your hand. You know, I rubbed my hand again. And then he said, well, me me all were serious. Stand up where we're at. Well, again, I could not stand up. But it kind of bumped me out again. <laughs> but God gave that pastor the wisdom to send a man back to me. And we will met on the hall and show me from the Bible what God as it said about eternal life, I hate said that I've been a new creature ever since. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you haven't turned back since then, so. Yeah. Were you uh, married to Rachel at that time? No, sir. Okay. So she got you straightened out later. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to share your salvation moment uh, when you got saved? I'll come back, Rosie. You want to come back? No, go ahead. Okay, so I was seven years old, and um, I had a, a experience where I was very angry with God. Clearly, I was angry with him, and I let him know it. I knew that my mother did not like me. My father was just there a couple of times a year, birthday, Christmas, that kind of thing. So I knew that he was not a, a, a good father. And I just said to God one day, I said, I know that you're God, and I don't understand. Why would you allow me to be born when my mother doesn't want me, my father doesn't want me? And uh, I literally went into this room that was kind of like a closet and uh, looked up and start talking to him about it. And I felt his message, his answer to me was, I want you, I love you. And I'm like, he, he was like, and so I want you to go to church and learn about me. <clears throat> These things, this message I was hearing very clearly in my mind. And I said to him, go to church. I said, who's gonna comb my hair? <laughs> who's gonna iron my clothes? And I heard his message to me saying, go as you are. There was a church just about a block away, First Presbyterian Church on 10th Street. David knows where that is. And um, so I, I looked. I did not have combed hair. I had wrinkled clothes. They didn't have permanent press clothes. And I put on those clothes, and I walked up the street to the church. I walked into the church. I went 
right in the front, and I was just, I just hung on every word the pastor was saying. And what I knew, what I understood at the age of seven was, mom and dad don't want me, and I'm an unloved little girl, but you are God and you love me. Amen. And so, and so then I, I just, I just decided I was going to go forward. And I understood about his message the way he wanted to teach me. I said, so there was a Jesus Christ who came to, to, to die for me, and he loves me, and I want to be baptized. So I conveyed that to the, to the people at the church, and they said, oh, well, we can't baptize you because you're too young. They said, you don't really understand what that's all about. And I just kind of looked at them like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and, and so they said, well, so we won't, we can't, because you don't know, and we won't, but you know, by the time you get 12, you'll know. So when I got 12, they allowed me get, to get baptized, and they said, now you understand. And without saying anything, I said to myself, I've always understood. Right. In other words, when I was seven, I understood. And I just, I just love it that as I look back at those years, number one, I know that so many things come, come to my mind when I think about salvation because I think about the body of Christ, the, 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 the humanity, that's what I want to say, and how many times we are <clears throat> sincere, but many times we're sincerely wrong. I'm still there today. Sometimes I'm sincere about doing this and doing that, and then later I find out, uh, that wasn't a good idea. The, the one thing, that, the many things that I love is the fact that God knows everything about everything and everything about everybody. And so one of my things since David's been going through what he's been going through and I realize how I'm taking that on because God brought us together and, 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 and David will be concerned about something that's going on with me medically or whatever and I say to him, I said, the one thing that I realize is God is still taking care of his little girl. I'm, I'm not this older person, but I'm still God's little girl. And that's the thing that gives me, that gives me peace when I don't have peace. Or concern about, you know, my recent thing is the eye condition. And um, uh, it, 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 it's, it's not serious, but it it can't be cured. So it's called blepharitis. And, and I was talking to David about it, and so, like the doctor said, one doctor says, you have this condition, and the way that, can I just take just a few more minutes to explain that? And they said the way to treat it, this the surgeon doctor, whom I had had um, a procedure where they thought I had cancer in one eye, and she said the way, she said you have this other issue, she said, the way to treat it is with baby shampoo. Clean your eyes with baby shampoo. So I've gone to two other physicians, and they have said, you know, take this medicine and this medicine, this, uh, these four different eye drops. And I use those eye drops every day. And, and I said, David, he said, he said, are you sure that's what it said? I said, look it up. Look it up. This is what these different doctors said. I said, so Google it. And he said, blepharitis. He said, the way to cure it is with baby shampoo. <laughs> and, and he got a chance to actually see that. And so, I, again, I say all that to say there's many things that we know, many things, so many more things that we do not know. But I keep going back to God is taking care of his little girl. So then I thought, okay, so I'm, I'm going to start using baby shampoo again. And I said to David a couple of days ago, I said, well, I've been using it like once a day and my eyes still feel horrible, just like dry, 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 scratchy, itchy, red, all that. And I said, so, uh, Lord, what would happen if I just used it m more often instead of once a day? So now I'm putting it in there about half a dozen times a day, and it feels better. <laughs> baby shampoo. <laughs> so the baby shampoo doesn't cure it. What it, it does, it treats it. It treats it, and it gives you comfort and that kind of thing. So... Moving, so it's on the screen, ordained decision. So Esther 9, 27, all this is on your handout too. The Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such joined themselves unto them so that it should not fail that they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time of year. So this is where the comprehensive comes in because it was going to be established uh, 
uh, to be practiced two days in the month of March. And that was that uh, Jewish calendar that Brian had up that was called the Jewish month of Adar. So has anyone ever eaten um, a Hamatashan cookie? What? <laughs> there it is right there. That is a Hamatashan cookie. Yeah, and um, you may have had some Jewish friends or you went to a bakery and they knew about it. But during the month of Purim, uh, they eat these cookies. Because if you notice that the last name of that cookie is Haman. Yeah. Yeah. And so they eat these cookies so that they will not forget this vicious man named Haman. And so these cookies and this jelly inside those cookies. And so this is celebrated in the month of Purim. And so they're remembering what God did for them and how they can remember. So I, I would not honor some evil person with a cookie, but, but that's, they're not honoring him. It's just remembering what God did for them by having some type of cookie called uh, Hama Hadashan. I think that's how you pronounce it. What month is Pure? March. March? Okay. Yeah. And it's two days. So it could be if you went to out to the Jewish community center, I bet you'll find cookies there in uh, that celebration of Purim. So, uh, so this is that Jewish tradition. So they eat these cookies during that month. And so I guess instead of just two days, they just celebrate the whole month. Uh, so they represent, supposedly they represent the hat, that triangle type, almost not quite, that look, supposedly looked like Haman's hat. So how do they know that? I don't know, but a traditional hand, they bring that down from generation to generation. So that was Haman's hat, the evil person. So, so, um, so you should know that your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren should hear about how God saved you. You should be telling them about your story. Because this generation that we are in right now, there is so much that's taking them away from the Bible. And they need to hear from their family. They need to hear from you. Even though for those nieces and nephews, those cousins, those kids, those young men, young ladies, young adults, they need to hear your story. You know, because that should be a tradition of you passing on what God did for you. You shouldn't be shy about it. Let them know what God has done. Because Psalm 34, 11 says, Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So they need to know the fear of the Lord. And it needs to come from you. And so letter A says, written. That's written record of God's work in your life and in your family's life. And it should be memorialized. You know, to, you remember that event annually or monthly. There are some people that, who celebrate their salvation birthday all the time. Sometimes they put it on Facebook. Sometimes they let people know that today is their spiritual birthday. Um, but if you don't know it, you know, just celebrate it all the time, you know. But Memorial Day is where folks go to the cemeteries, you know, and they, they go because they want to remember their loved ones. I haven't been to the cemetery in a long time. I used to go. Then I realized it was just a habit. And I'm thinking, okay, my family has a plot. They have a plot over in Highland Park, which is over in Kansas City, Kansas, off of State Avenue. But, but some of my family there and some in another one. And it's like, I can remember them without having to go to the cemetery. So I, I don't criticize people for going to the cemetery. I think that's a great thing to do, you know. But, but I will not criticize them because they go to make them feel like that's not necessary. I think everyone grieves and celebrates in their own way. And so you can't, you can't make a rule for somebody to tell them that they can't do that. You know, my, my brother passed away from a disease called Guillain-Barre. He was about 50-something. And his, his wife went to the cemetery every day for one year. Every day religiously for one year and I told everybody leave her alone that's how she grieves you know and and so she wanted she could not forget my brother they did so much together so 
So does anyone, here's another question. Does anyone have uh, an event in your life that you're willing to share with us? A time that you will never forget. Maybe a time that God brought you through a tough time or a tough situation. And, and the question is, how did he deliver you? So the question is, can you remember a time where you went through a tough time? Because we're talking about Haman here. We're talking about how the Jews went through a really tough time. They were on the verge of possibly being killed by the Persians and others because of Haman. And he wanted to assassinate Mordecai, which would, well, Esther would have been killed too and, and all her people. So can you remember a time in your life that you went through a tough time and God brought you through it? And, you know, it could have been a struggle that, uh, it could have been a, a health struggle, it could have been a marriage struggle, it could have been a family struggle, it could have been in your job. Does anybody remember a time where you, God brought you through something? Vince? Yeah, I had, uh, I had cancer and, uh, you know, I was over, we were over at KCBT at the time. And, you know, you always like to think that when you have something go wrong, that that you are very spiritual in it. You know, you would trust God for it all and all that stuff. But I can truly say that God gave me perfect peace about everything that was going on. And I never worried about whether I died or whether I lived. You know, I Paul's remembrance of, you know, whether I live or whether I die, whether I go home and be with the Lord, it's all good. And God gave me perfect peace about that during that time. And I know I was going through uh, the IVs all the time. Every, once a week, I'd go in and get an IV, uh, get the chemo. And uh, I thought to myself, there were all these other people there at the same time. And God gave me that opportunity to witness to those people in a way that I'd never witnessed because I'm not bold witnesser. I really am not. But God gave me a perfect peace about it. And they couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> they were there. You know, <laughs> what were they going to do? But I, but I couldn't understand. You know, I knew how it was with me and the ups and the downs and all that stuff. And I thought to myself, how do these people that don't have God make it through? Yeah. But God gave me perfect peace about it. Yeah. And I was fortunate God, you know, cured me. You know, I, of course, in the mission, you never know. You're never, you're never cured. Totally yeah. Totally cured. But Amen. That was back 2006, 2004. 2004. 2004. Yeah. Did you your hand up? I had cancer, too. Oh, okay. I had kidney cancer. And the way they found it was absolutely marvelous. I was getting physical therapy on my legs, and I kept saying, we can't, we can't, there's nothing wrong with your legs. We can't find anything wrong with you. Go get an MRI done. Call your doctor and get an MRI. An MRI done, within an hour, I got a call saying I had kidney cancer. From my but physical therapist. Wow. You know, they're the ones that told me to go. And then I went and had surgery, and I had more, more people asking me, how did I make it with him? How did I make it with me and cancer? They kept watching you. They watched to see what you do. Are you getting upset? Are you getting mad? Are you mad at God? And I was at perfect peace with my cancer and his. Whether God took us home or cured us, I had no chemo. All I had was just my kidney removed. But people watched me. Very, and then I had friends who had cancer. And one of my children, she had brain cancer, and I said, do you know the people are watching you on how you react? And she goes, Really? I said, watch. She started watching all the people around her. They were all watching to see if she was going to get upset or mad at God. I was at peace with God. I thought, if he wants me to have it, I have it. Good. I've been in remission for, I had it in 2008. I've been in remission ever since. I mean, that's what I call it. Yeah. So my doctor said, you're never cured of cancer. It's, you always have a cancer cell there waiting to say, hi. And whether it comes back or it doesn't, there's always someone that we're waiting. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, but we all have cancer cells in our body, right? Yes. Yes. So it's how we feed them, or whether it's hereditary or chemicals or whatever. There's, you know, um, 
I think that's one of the reasons why we have to be careful about the things we eat, you know, reading labels and, you know, that's funny as I, when I, dr I don't drink sodas hardly any anymore, I drink fruit water, but every now and then somebody says, do you want a, a diet drink? And I'm looking at the can and I say, oh, that's got aspartame. I don't want it. So it's like, so I'm real good about watching out for aspartame, but I probably pick up something somewhere else on something else. You know, so it's it's like um, we have to be very conscious of what we eat and what we drink, those type of things. And then in some cases, there's nothing you can do because it's there, you know, and uh, something you're exposed to. You remember when everybody was treating their yard with Roundup, right. you know, spraying and all that. And come to find out that the people who made Roundup, they knew that was, was affecting people. And so they, there's been billions of dollar lawsuit with that, but now people are smart. I don't want to mess with Roundup, but all the little cheap name stuff, they come on the market that comes out of China and all these other places. And before you know it, you're spraying that, and Same you're still affected. Right. Yeah. So, so basically, um, anybody else have a a tough situation that you went through? I know my toughest situation, I think, was when I got married as a young guy in San Diego and I was 21 maybe and uh, young and dumb and uh, very mature I was a probation officer and I got married and shouldn't have gotten married and I did and uh, this lady had more male friends than I did and, and it's just it was very difficult so I would never uh, ask anyone to go through what I went through just just the nights that I didn't know if I would wake up, you know, just, just just running, risking sleeping in that house and just the things that she did. But the the toughest part was when she ran off with my boy and he was five years old. And I'm just telling you, you're just hurt because you're trying to figure out like, okay, Lord, what do I do? And it was mu not much what I can do except my family said, look, you've been through enough. You need to come home to Kansas City. And I didn't want to do it because I, that was my life there, all the what I had built up. But I knew it, that that was probably God saying, okay, you need to go under your family so that they could minister to you. And so that was a tough time. God brought me through that. Uh, but I would never want someone else to go through it. So sometimes God allows us to go through tough times like he did the Jews here. They went through a dangerous situation because because Haman wanted to take them out. And so sometimes we, we just have to recognize that God is in control. He is totally in control. And so Mordecai, he writes this decree, you know, for every family. And uh, further down on letter C, it talks about official. The decree was officially sent to the 127 provinces and all of Jews to reach them. They wanted to reach them. So there are some habits and practices that you want your children and your grandchildren, young and old, to see you practicing personally. And uh, uh, I, I remember it was it was Beverly. Beverly was discipling a lady, and I don't know if you re quite remember this. And this lady had this thing in her yard, and she was practicing. I don't know if she was worshiping that thing or, but she was honoring that thing and, and it had nothing to do with the Bible. And, uh, and I remember we talked about it and, and I, I don't think she ever removed it. She finally did. She finally did. Yeah, and, it's, and so it's, it's, it's interesting how people have these traditions and these practices that they think it's like, well, you're praying to Mary, you know, and you, you're worshiping Mary who's, who's, who's dead. And she's not living as a person that can help you. When the Bible clearly says that we, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And so people do those practices and, you know, they will wear a cross. I wear a cross, and, um, but Jesus is not on that cross. You know, I don't want to wear a cross that has him on it. 
you know, I wear the cross to symbolize the, the, his death, burial, and resurrection. But there are so many habits that people and traditions that people still do based on the fact that it, it was passed down. And so we have to be careful about what we do, and, and we have to be honoring the Lord. So that, the third one was sustained decision. It's, uh, that's making sure that the landmarks in, you, in your life and your family's life are remembered. So, so the leadership has to be established. So you start with godly leaders. When we look at Harvest Baptist Church, we look at how God is continuing to bless this church and we are continuing to produce leaders. And, and each church has its own way of sending men out and sending women out. And we're not, we're not all the same. Midtown is a totally different, that's a young church. So they have a lot of young people down there. That, their college and a young adult class runs about 200. That's how big it is. And so they are, they are, they've got Bible studies in all the schools, you know, UMKC and Penn Valley and all these, they got all these Bible studies. And so these young people are on fire for the Lord. So we don't need to compare ourselves to them. We want to see what God wants to do here in terms of sending men and women out. So, so, um, I kind of want to wrap it up as I go down, but so Mordecai's decree was the sustainable because God established him as a leader. And I believe in my heart that, that God has established Alan as our leader. And so we follow you know, what he does. And does everybody agree with everything he does? No. No, that we sit in pastor's meetings and just, we go through stuff and it's like, oh, okay. So I'm known as the guy in pastor's meeting who brings up stuff. So it, there's a joke that runs around the pastor's meeting. We go around the room. Anybody got anything? They go around the room. I've done mine. And then when everybody's done, I say, ah, I got something else. They go, there's, there's Dave again. And so I, I like to ask the hard questions. You know, and I like to bring up those things that maybe someone else is not thinking about. But, but he's gracious enough that he listens to what we're saying and he will give his opinion as to whether or not it makes sense to, to do those things. But, but his leadership is effective. And that's what it was with Mordecai. Mordecai convinced Esther that this is something that she should do. And so, um, you know, it's sustainable because God has established him as the leader. And that's what it is. So godly traditions are sustained through effective leadership. So you and I should look for ways that to bring our families together. And um, unfortunately, um, yesterday, uh, when Rosie was going to the beauty shop, um, her daughter called me and said uh, that her nephew had passed. And so we had just seen him 4th of July. And he was at her niece's house, and they used her house. She lives over there in Raytown by that lake, whatever that lake is in Raytown, off of 67th, where the Nixons used to live in that area. And... Uh, so he, was, he had sickle cell and some other issues. And they just found him in his apartment because no one, he wouldn't answer the phones. So his brother went and found him. So, um, so that's the tradition was everybody got together for 4th of July. So what prompted that death is they're saying, we need to get together more often so that people can see each other you know, more often. Because in my family, the only time I saw most of my family was at funerals. Yeah. And believe me, we had a lot of them. And that's when you see people. And other than that, it's like, oh, how you doing? And then you, then you find out you got cousins you didn't know you had because of a, a death in the family. So I think we should, all of us should look for ways to, for our families to get together a little bit more often so that we can at least fellowship together and that could be an opportunity. You don't have to stand in front of the whole crowd and preach, but there could be an opportunity that you could pull somebody off to the side and tell them about the Lord. You know, because if you can get one person saved, that's a, that's a blessing because the angels will shout for that. So there are there are some pagan holidays, you know, that 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 people celebrate the pagan gods, like Easter. Okay, people criticize us and other churches for celebrating Easter. Although we like to call it Resurrection Sunday. But, but we're not really celebrating Easter. We're celebrating the resurrection of Christ. 
And so, so yes, sir. Uh, Christmas is another pagan holiday. They worship the evergreen tree, mm -hmm. and we changed it to the birth of Christ. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and uh, we know that Jesus Christ was not born on December 25th. He wasn't born on the 25th. We know that. So what we want to do is, is use that time. So it, would make, it wouldn't make sense if we didn't take Easter or Resurrection Sunday or Christmas and not give the good news of Christ. By saying, oh, that's a pagan holiday, so I'm not doing anything. And, you know, I, I was telling Brian Robinson, I went to school with Brian's dad. We all grew up in Kansas City, Kansas. And his uncle... I tell him, I said, we were playing basketball one year, and we were in a tournament. So we had the evening game that was supposed to start at 6. So all of our guys weren't there yet, and the referee was ready for us to get on the floor. Well, we only have four guys. You can actually play a game if you only have two. You just need somebody to take it out and somebody to throw it into. But it's better off with, if you got all five instead of five against two. Well, we had four. So his uncle, Wayne, was sitting on the bench. And I said, Wayne, you need to get in the game. He goes, no, it's not sunset yet. And I said, come on, Wayne. He said, no, sunset is 6.08, whatever time he said. And because he was seven-day Adventist. <laughs> and he refused. That's their rules, their tradition, their doctrines. And he said he's not going to get on that floor until exactly sunset. Well, I mean, people have all these different things that they go by, but what does the Bible say? And so, so we worship on the first day of the week. Saturday is their Sabbath. And so, and so they are not going to do any work on that day. So I'm saying you should be focusing on what does God want you to do and, and try to keep, and don't celebrate false holidays, recognize Jesus Christ who died and was buried and rose again. That's what you should be doing. So, so these Jews celebrated the Feast of Purim and they did that because of what has happened in their life and Mordecai was, risked his life because he went against Haman and he was willing to die for his people and so was Esther. So while we don't celebrate Purim, we can celebrate God's deliverance in our lives. So we, in, as the body of Christ in this church, what do we celebrate? The Lord's Supper. We celebrate the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25 says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I would delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Think about this. Because you've been saved, you've been delivered by Christ. You've been delivered. Yes, sir. Dave, this doesn't really have anything to do with it. But do you remember Bernice Briles? She was with the deaf ministry. Okay. And uh, she was terminal with cancer for over five years. And Mac House, Mac and Lovely House, and Linda and I went out to visit her. And we were talking, and she praised God for her cancer. She said, Had I not had cancer, there are people in hospitals doctor's offices that I would not have had the opportunity to witness to. Yeah. And she witnessed everybody. Yeah. And then the next thing out of her head came, I just don't understand why God's keeping me around. And I said, as long as you're doing what you're doing, God's not done with you. That's right. That's right. So I think, I hope that everyone takes that to, to heart, the, the fact that God has a plan for every one of you. And, you know, 
you should not uh, not talk about the Lord. You should want to talk about him to other people you want to share. And mainly, mainly share it in your family. Because the Jews have this tradition. If the Jews can celebrate Purim every year in the month of March, then why can't we celebrate with our families in some kind of way what God has done for us? You know, even if you send them a letter or something, an annual card or whatever you do, um, just take take the opportunity to share God's God's love with them. Amen. 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 So we are close to. We got enough time. We got about 20 minutes, and uh, to find your your normal seat. <laughs> 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 yeah, and so, so uh, what happened is, uh, yes, yes, baby. You know, when he brought up that uh, about her being glad that she had cancer, you know, I, I was listening and wondering if I should share anything that we've been through with our daughter. And, you know, my, my daughter, Dina Tucker, passed away in 1993, and uh, she had cancer also. And uh, it was lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that mm-hmm. she had. And, but um, anyway, um, God has used that to allow me to share Christ with so many people, just in so many ways. And it just, you're not glad that your daughter's died, but just to have that testimony of how God got you through it. And I, I've I made a poem. I, many of you know about my poem. It's okay, and um, he got us through that, and and to his glory. And I feel like whatever he can use, let him do it. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, whatever we we can do to give glory to the Lord, no matter what it is, no matter. And it's the things that hurts the deepest that brings his him glory. Mm-hmm. Because we can come out of it and say, thank you, God. Amen. Thank you. Because that opens more doors. Just, and Augie and I used to travel a lot in the, in the uh, plane. And I'd be, of course, he was on standby. And we would usually not be together. But I'd be sitting with someone that I had never met before. And I'd eventually get to share with them Christ. And... I know you said we had 20 minutes, so. (laughs) 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 I was was in the airplane this one time, and this lady, we were on the on the plane for quite a while, and I thought, Lord, can't you allow me to visit with this lady and share with her Christ? And not a word was said. Not a word was said for for a long time, and then she had three crosses tattooed on her hand and I, I just I thought well maybe that will be an opening and I, I asked her about it and she said one was once for me and one's for for my brother and the other one's for the, her other brother that, that died and uh, then she started talking about her mother just could not get over that death and it just about drove her crazy and she went on and on about her mother she didn't know what to do for her and blah 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 and then I then I shared with her my poem and I said maybe this will help her and she says I shared with her that my daughter had died and she would I mean from then on she was asking me questions how can you know how can I help my mother and and I just was able to just share with her Christ Jesus Amen. At the end of there. and it just I mean God opened so many doors yeah. from something that's so hurtful that you, you don't think you can live through it but he gets glory. Amen. I appreciate that, Beth. Yeah, that's... uh...